Good morning. This home retreat begins with Psalm 118, verse 132. Turn and have mercy on me, as is your rule for those who love your name. Simple verse. Crying out to the Lord for mercy and in need is of course very common in the Bible and in the Psalms especially. There are at least 23 such verses, 10 of them nearly half, in the long alphabetical Psalm 118. I'm particularly wanting to note the connection in verse 132 of the cry for mercy with the reference to loving the name of the Lord. After a few times of meditating on this verse uh, myself in, in Lectio Divina, uh, I found uh, myself being put in mind of a number of the healing miracles of Jesus. It is by no means the case in all the healings that the person in need calls out to the Lord. For example, in the famous story of the paralytic lowered through the roof, it is the action of his friends making the hole in the ceiling, dramatically, and lowering him down that constitutes the obvious plea for mercy without him saying anything. Jesus says to him, my child, your sins are forgiven. That's in Mark chapter 2. Similarly, in Luke's account of the raising of the son of the widow of Nain, it is simply the sight of her and the funeral procession that moves the Lord to pity. Luke chapter 7. Sometimes, however, there is a begging dialogue, and I'm going to give four examples. The Gentile woman of Mark chapter 7, who Jesus refers to by implication as a Gentile dog, we call that a racial slur today, holds her ground in a dignified way, replying, Ah, yes, sir, but little dogs under the table eat the scraps from the children. To which Jesus replies, For saying this, you may go home happy. And she does. In Mark chapter 9, at the foot of the mountain of transfiguration, the father of the boy infested with a horrible, dumb spirit prays, If you can, have pity on us and help us. Jesus challenges him to have faith. The father replies with the great line, I have faith. Help my lack of faith. A third example, somewhat similar to these previous two, comes in John, chapter 4. A royal official asks Jesus to cure his son. As with the Gentile woman, Jesus seems to reply testily, and maybe also testingly. Unless you see signs and portents, you will not believe. The man replies in a dignified and moving way, Sir, come down before my child dies. All of these have something of the beseeching of the Psalms and of the verse from Psalm 118, Turn 
and have mercy on me. I've mentioned them all, however, to lead up to the healing of the blind beggar Bartimaeus, the last of the healing miracles in Mark chapter 10, the last verses of chapter 10, which happened as Jesus is leaving Jericho on his way to Jerusalem and to the culmination of his ministry. Father Henry mentioned in a homily a few weeks ago that this is a favourite of his, and I'm inclined to say the same uh, on, uh, of me. Let me read it and, and then make some comments. They reached Jericho, and as he left Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting at the side of the road. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and cry out, Son of David, have pity on me. And many of them scolded him and told him and told him to keep quiet. But he only shouted all the louder, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him here. So they called the blind man over. Courage, they said, get up, he is calling you. So, throwing off his cloak, he jumped up and went to Jesus. Then Jesus spoke. What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabunai. Let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has saved you. And at once his sight returned and he followed him along the road. So to, to comment on a few points. Bartimaeus, when at last summoned to come to Jesus, throws off his cloak. It seems perhaps a minor detail, and the other evangelists in their versions of the story leave it out. A pointless detail, perhaps they thought. I must say, though, it suggests to me the dramatic nature of being called to Jesus and how one leaves one's previous life or at least some part of it behind. Reinforcing this is the final phrase of the story. Bartimaeus, according to Mark, follows Jesus along the road. Again, that, that may seem just a, 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 a factual detail. But this is the road to Jerusalem, to Jesus' destiny. A few verses earlier, Jesus has said to the sons of Zebedee, to James and John, that they will share his cup. And before this, if anyone wants to be a follower of mine, let him renounce himself and take up his cross and follow me. I think there's nothing merely incidental about following Jesus along the road. 
What is it like? What is it like to follow Jesus along the road? Mark gives a detail unique to him, which seems aptly to convey just how it feels. In Mark chapter 22, verse 32, again shortly before the Bartimaeus story, we are told that Jesus and his disciples were on the road going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was ahead of them. Those following were in a daze and they were apprehensive. Well, well, they might be. I think we know something in our Christian lives when things are not always so clear, certainly not so easy, about that apprehensive days. In the context of the psalm, however, turn and have mercy on me, as is your rule for those who love your name, it is above all striking to me that twice the blind man calls out, as did the psalmist, have pity on me. Notwithstanding the irritation of the bystanders who seek to shush him, and he uses a name. For some of the other miracles I have mentioned this morning, the supplicant uses an address of respect for Jesus, variously translated as Sir, or Teacher, or Master. At first, Bartimaeus uses a title, Son of David. But then, once he actually comes to Jesus, he uses an address which, strikingly, is left in the original Aramaic, Rabuni, my master, my teacher. It is one of those rare occasions, Mark has more than the other evangelists, but he only has a few, where we, we hear the original Aramaic, uh, an offshoot of, 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 um, the, of Hebrew. We hear the actual word which was used that day. And it's the same phrase that Mary of Magdala uses in the Garden of the Resurrection in John, when at last she recognises the Lord. Jesus calls her by her name, Mary. She replies to him, not sir, as earlier when she thought he was the gardener, but Rabuni, my master, my teacher as is your rule for those who love your name. In the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 10, the writer reassures that God will not forget the love that we have for his name. His name, Son of David. Rabuni, according to the blind beggar Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. And perhaps most favourite of all in the long history and tradition of the church, it's the name Jesus, the holy name to which Christians down the centuries have had such a devotion. As the Jesu Dulcis Memoria, the hymn attributed to St Bernard of Clairvaux, has it, 
And I close this meditation uh, with this, this verse. Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast, but sweeter far thy face to see and in thy presence rest. May it be so. And may God bless you all this day and always in his holy name, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.